I'm going to tell you a story. And I don't think it matters much what way I tell it. I had to get a heartburn when I ate an egg. I love an egg in a cup with butter and a grain of salt and pepper, but I do get an ogis heartburn. And the doctor told me to quit eating eggs because he's a useless doctor and couldn't cure the heartburn. But I never call it indigestion. I had to keep that word for something else. My father died when I was seven. He was taking the roof off the bayer because the iron was in shite with rust and he had the roof half off and there come a gust of wind and he had a sheet of iron in his hand and it took him clean off the roof into a yard at the back of the bayer. Now the only bit of concrete we had about the house at the time and he was killed stone dead. And to make matters worse, Mammy threw a clatter of fucks into him from an open roof of a day like that. And that same doctor that told me to quit eating the eggs, he was after coming to SWAT at the time, and he was called for, and he come out, and after 20 minutes examining me father, he said he was dead. Now, he was the most useless bastard of a doctor. That was it. I had no father from then on. And I was sent to London ten years after, when I was 17. And I was put into a van with a shovel and a cement mixer, and I couldn't even drive. And I broke the shovel the second day and the mixer only lasted a week and we had to change the van after six months. But I kept going. I was a fierce worker. And then I got sacked years and years after for hitting a paddy with the side of a pig. Because it was in me fucking way. And I came home here then. Things were picking up here at the time. And I got a job working in Quinns doing the concrete. And I concreted the lane up to the house for Mammy. Now 374 metres long and just over three metres wide. A long narrow hoor of a lane. And I bought a wee mini digger of a lad below in Kinlaw and a tractor and trailer off me Uncle John in Milltown and I started doing bits of digging in the evenings when I come home from Quinn's. Now I got on far better with the digger than I ever did with the spent mixer. Well there was a radio on it. And I'd be digging out foundations for houses or tanks for slathed sheds in the evenings when I come home from Quinn's and I'd have northern sound on on the radio and a bit of country and western music and the digger ticking over nicely. Now you couldn't ask to be in a better place. And the thing was going good enough. And then Mammy fell coming out of bingo one night below Bella Connell and she broke her hip and she got an infection in the hospital and she was dead within a fortnight. And yon same silly fucker of a doctor that couldn't cure the heartburn, he was on call that night too. I have three sisters. A lot older than me, they all went to work in Dublin long before I ever went to England. And two of them, Mary and Rita's married, and then Mary decided to become a lesbian after the second child started school. And Mammy was raging, and blame yon same doctor for not twigging it when Mary had the measles that time. And when Mammy died, there was no will. I was living at home, and there was 47 acres of land that had been leased to a neighbour while I was away in England. And this neighbour still had the land because I had no interest in farming. And then the sisters came down one Sunday and said they wanted to sell the house and the land and divide the whole lot up into four. And I fucking lost the cool because I'd have a fierce bad temper like that. That'd be part of the indigestion. And I let us little fucks into them and told them to get the fuck from about the place that I'd give them their share over the next few years but that I wanted to keep the place, the house. And Mary, the lesbian one, she wasn't too bad but the other two were after investing in some properties or shares at the time and they wanted the whole lot sorted out there and then and I fucked and I blinded out of me and Mary sat into the back of the car that thought after coming down in a big white Mercedes and, and Rita, the one that... Th but Rita, she's married to a guard, a detective above on Stower Street and this was her white Mercedes that he was after buying her for her 50th birthday and she was holding the keys of this yoke in her hand, pointing them into my face and going on about how I had fucked off Tingling when Mammy wasn't well because she'd have had the indigestion the same as me and so she was a raven alcoholic. Or she said she nearly burned the house several times while I was away and I said pity she didn't. But I told Rita how I had concreted the lane up to the house for Mammy and I reminded Rita of how Mammy died because it was Rita that got Mammy onto the bingo one of the times she was off the drink and apart from the fact that she fell on the way out from the bingo it was the bingo itself that was the main reason for Mammy giving up the will to live in the first place and not the drink or Daddy being dead or Mary being a lesbian it was the fucking bingo and it was that thick with the whole lot of them I just grabbed the keys out of her hand and I drove a big fucking scrape up the side wing of the car Oh, she went to sweat and real quiet. Oh, she says, oh, that's it, so. And she took the keys off me, sat back into the into the car and drove off down the good concrete lane. And I'd say she had the solicitor's letter half composed in her head before she got to the road because she'd be real fucking ticked like that. She'd be like me. 
And uh, let the come then Tuesday morning from solicitors Burke and Kent in Radfarnham. I was in their office after, above in Dublin. Ah, a fierce hard spot to get to. A big tank of fish inside the door and leather seats and a, and a fucking pencil draw and a U2 de bollocks. I never drank. Daddy used to go to Tinny Smith's of a Monday and Wednesday and Thursday. And then Mammy go with him Friday and Saturday when there'd be some of the girls at home to mind me. And then on Sunday we'd all go to Tinny Smith's and we'd have tato for the dinner. And me and the girls would be sent out to the pool room to watch the bigger lads play in pool. And then Mammy and Daddy would come in at three o'clock for holy hour. Well, it was the longest fucking day. And Daddy would sing the rocks of bone on the way home. And I fucking hated that song and I hated pool, but I couldn't get enough tato. I had a ferocious appetite for tato and calvin cola and Farley's rusks. And I don't ever remember being overweight when I was a young fellow, but Rita said it was the day I scrapped the car. She said you were always a greedy fat bastard. And when I went to London first, I stayed in a guest house with full board. And when I'd ate the dinner in the evening, I used to go down to a place called Swiss Cottage and there was a takeaway in it called the Fat Friar. And sure, I had never been in a chipper before and I'd ate several times in this place before I went to bed because that's all there was to do because I didn't play pool and I... I didn't drink. I was 27 stone one time. Fucking bastards of chips. I'm going to tell you a story. There was a lad from Bawn by the name of Speedy sent with me on a job one time when I was beyond in England when I was the 27 stone and I was driving the van and I was eating this pastry yolk that I was after buying in a deli place beside his flat where I had picked him up. And although this fellow was from Bawn I didn't know him. He was in his 60s and had been in London most of his life. And he says to me, when we were only a short time in the van, he says, how many of them yokes do you eat in a week? And normally if anyone said anything to me about me weight or what I was eating, I'd tell them to fuck off and mind their own business. But it was in fierce bad form this day with indigestion. And I just pulled in along the side of the road to where we were going. And I says to him, says, hey, you wait there. I want to show you something. And I got out of the van and I went around to the passenger seat and I opened the door. I, I give him a notorious box in the jaw. Oh, you got a no just shock. And I pulled him out of the van and I hammered the shade out of him. And he was unconscious and I was still kicking him. And I don't know why. And then I saw there was blood coming out of his ear and I stopped and I started to cry because that's what happened, Daddy, when he fell off the roof. I was the first to find him and he had blood coming out of his ear the same as this fella from Bourne. And I didn't even know this fella's right name. And I put him into the back of the van with the shovel and the cement mixer and a lock of bricks who were going out to a, do a job way out in Kensington, doing a job on a chimney. This fellow was a brickie. And I brought him to a hospital on the Fulham Road and I told, him I, was, I told them I was after finding him on the street. And this wee young Irish nurse says to me, she says, are you all right? You seem upset. And I said, hey, no, no, not a bother. I said, hey, but can you check if he's going to pull through? And she says, I will, wait there. In the waiting room, I says I'd rather not. I have, I, I, I'm go, I, I'm heading out on a job, and I knew by the way she was looking at me, she didn't believe one word I was saying. And she come back then, and she says, "You, you're not as tough as you thought you were." He's awake. He said to say thanks for bringing him into the hospital. She said they're going to do a few scans on him and uh, X-rays, uh, but he should be okay. And I says, "Hey, what was his name?" And she says, "James Leddy." And I started to cry. Ah, it's just... No one knew he was James Lady. We only called him Speedy on account of being so fucking slow at the building. And she says, why don't you come in tomorrow and, 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 and go in to see that fella? She says, ask for me and I, I'll, I'll bring you up to him. She, she said her name was Jacinta Power. She was from down the country somewhere. And I went in the next day and the first thing this James Lady says to me, he says, are you all right? Oh, she says, I, I'm not a bother. And it turns out this James Liddy man had a, had a lot of trouble himself when he went over to England first. And he seemed to know a lot more about me and what was going on in my head than I did myself. And then he says, there's places you can go to get help. So I cut the visit short after that. 
and I was just walking down the corridor and the wee Irish nurse Jacinta Power comes running after me with a slip of paper with the name and number of a doctor that I could go to. And I thanked her, but sure I wasn't going to any doctor to get help from anyone because I knew it all. And this James Leddy, oh, he got out the next day and someone said he went home, but I don't think so because I asked for him when I got back myself and they said that man never come home from the day he left. So now... I tried several different ways of doing away with myself. I tried holding my breath one time. One evening after we were coming home from Tinny Smith's, Sonny Daddy wasn't singing the Rocks of Bourne that, that day. Because Mammy was after getting real drunk in the pub and made a complete show of herself. And there was a big row in the house and I went into the room and I held my breath until I near burst. And I was raging because I couldn't hold on. And then I took a, a go of pills one time. When I was being aunt in England, I was doing a job way out in this real posh part of London for a woman, and she was putting in a. I was digging out a foundation for a conservatory, and she had told me to use the bathroom in the house when I wanted to go to the toilet because she didn't want to see me pissing outside. And she said she'd leave out a key for me even when she was away, and she was away this evening, and I had to go to the bathroom, and and I was in fierce bad form the same evening. And I went into this bathroom and there was a press over the sink and a, and a mirror door. And it was a kind of half open. And inside this door there was, there was all sorts of pills and tablets stacked one on top of the other. And I, I had never seen the lick of it. So many of them. You wouldn't see it in a chemist. And I was just in such bad form. And I hated everything. Especially the lad looking back at, out, at this, out at this mirror at me. And I got into a fit of a rage and I opened yon door and I took out every pill and tablet out of, out of the containers and I emptied them into a big glass jar that she had for howling flowers and I fucked the flowers into the bathtub and I run the tap on them and I drank down as many as I could and a heap of them got stuck to the, to the side and the bottom and I, I run the tap on them again and I swished it around and I drank the whole lot down. And I waited. And sure enough, in a few few minutes I found myself getting dizzy and then I says to myself I don't want to die in a toilet and I went back out to the front door and I put on the Wellingtons I wanted to go out with a bit of dignity and that was it it was gone out woke up the next morning they were after pumping me out sure I wasn't dead I wasn't near dead so most of the tablets I took was Rennie's and fucking vitamin pills I was healthier than the whole hospital put together. That's when I started calling me problem indigestion. At least it was a word you could use. But even a feed of Rennies wouldn't shift it. And I was at a train station then another evening. It was a fierce warm evening and, and my van wouldn't start. I had to leave it on the site and I had been working ahead for a, a half an hour and was fierce warm and the fucking thing wouldn't start and I had to leave it there and I'd go up and get a train and the train up on top of a hill, whatever I was doing up there. I walked up to this train station and I was fierce hungry and I bought a Yorkie chocolate bar and I was sitting in the, at the train station eating this chocolate and it melting and I was the 27 stone and I was sweating and everyone was looking at me and the state of me. And I just got into a fit of a rage and I heard a train coming. And I got up off the seat and I headed for the platform. And when I got as far as the platform, I kept going. And I dislocated my shoulder when I hit the track. And then the train that was coming was on the other fucking track. Oh, I found a wish it would come by my head. Missed me. And then it took them about two hours. Everything had to be stopped for about two hours. And they were lifting me back up onto the platform. And I heard a no lassie saying, oh, he must have been drunk. So I pretended to be. I just closed my eyes and pretended to be drunk. And they brought me off then to a hospital way out. In the, uh, this was out near Ipswich. And of course, just because it was a hospital, I thought that I might see a wee Irish nurse like the last one. But so there were all English nurses there, all polite as anything, but not a friendly face among them. And then, then they gave me a shot of morphine and they put back in my shoulder and, and I got out that evening and and I had to have wear a sling for a lock of days. And, you know, I liked it. I don't know what it was. It was just that 
for the first time in my life, people could see that there was something wrong with me. And I rang me boss, a fellow by the name of Jack McGovern. He was a second or third cousin of my mother's. That's why I was sent over there in the first place. And I, ah, he was a very nice fella. And of course he knew that the, there was something wrong with me. But he never held it against me. And I told him, say, you'll have to take off a few days. And he says, you can take the week off. He says, you're the best worker I ever had. Just had a great week. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't lay in bed or, or, or waste the week. I, I, I don't know what it was about this sling. I just gave me an, kind of a bit of confidence. And I used to get up early enough in the morning and go for a bit of walk. And then one day I went, I kept walking and I ended up down beside the hospital on the Fulham Road. And then I went into the hospital, of course, thinking that I might see Jacinta Power, but she wasn't, didn't seem to be there that day. And then I came out of the hospital and... And I went across the road to this public park and there was a wee path around the park and I went for a walk around the path and landed back where I started from, didn't think much of that. And then I just went over and I sat down on a park bench and I was feeling good about myself, although I had the arm in a sling and the whole lot. And the next thing someone said, what nice nurse did that for you? And it was Jacinta Power. Her and a friend that had been out for a walk in the park, only the friend didn't seem that gone and talking to me and she excused herself said she had to go back to work had to make a phone call or something and then Jacinta Power come over and sat beside me there on the park bench and sure I had never really been sitting beside a woman that close ever before and I had been sitting you see with me legs apart and then when she sat beside me I, I didn't think that was right and I, I tried crossing my legs but sure, when you're 25 or 26 stone that doesn't work too well and then I just put my knees together, and she says, do you want to go to the toilet? I to say no. And she says, well, quit fucking fidgeting. And then she says, did you ever go to see that doctor? I say no. And she says, how are you feeling since? I to say up and down. And she says, well, how are you feeling today? I to say today's one of my better days. And then I said, no. No, today's my best day. Today's my best day in a long time. And she said, oh, I'm mean, I lucky now to meet you today of all days. And it's not now that the sun was shining and the birds were singing. Sure, I don't know what the birds were doing. It could have been raining for all I know. But I just I just remember her sitting so close to me and, and looking at her, her skin and her mouth opening and closing when she was talking to me. And the next thing I says, I says, are you about tomorrow? I said, when I thought about it after, I never thought I'd be able to ask a woman for a date. And that's what I was after doing. Says, hey, will you be about tomorrow? Oh, says she, I'm about every day. I says, hey, well, I'll see you tomorrow. And she says, well, maybe the next day. You have a, an appointment to make with that doctor tomorrow. She says, I'll see you Friday. And she went off, smiling. And that's... When I decided that I wanted to get better. This place that I was in, this dark place, now had Jacinta Power in it. And I was going to get better for her. And I got up off yon set and I walked around the little path all three or four times, always ending back where I started. And I said, fuck this for a game of soldiers. And I, I didn't get a bus or a train home. I walked three or four miles and I, I, I lost over three stone on the way home, in my head. And I had no problem finding the slip of paper with the name and number of the doctor. I hadn't kept it for the number. I had kept it because it was Jacinta Power had given it to me. And I rang this Dr. Terence Brady on the phone in the hall of the place I was staying. And a young one answered it and said there was after being a cancellation for the next day. And could I come in at four o'clock? And I said, I will. I will.